And um, I appreciate the fact that you guys are here. Yes. Uh, and also, I want to invite uh, members from the IEEE uh, to visit us from time to time. I believe that we will have some topics that will be also uh, of great interest to you guys. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um. So uh, before I start, uh, I, I hear a strong echo, Kai. Uh, not from my side. So I, I try to okay. cycle everybody except you. I sound like okay. everybody. Maybe you get closer to the, um, the speaker. OK, let's, let's try now. Hi. Yeah, there are a few few more people kind of signing in that that's why you you hear the bits okay do you hear me fine yes Hi. yeah very clear so maybe we want to go to a full screen okay <laughs> okay. Huh. And business. And um, uh, after about twenty years of. Um, experience in design in the in the chip design business uh, i move more towards intellectual property and um, i would like to share tonight about uh, one of the topics that has been um, uh, in the mind of many uh, electrical engineers because it's, it's the fascinating study of um, tesla and, and edison uh, but tonight i would like to look at the story and i would like to look at the story from a technology perspective but I also would like to look at the story from uh, the side of intellectual property and take a different angle. And um, there is a lot of material that I uh, that I have to cover. So I'm going to try to do to go fairly fast and save some time for questions uh, at the at the very end. And and you will see that I'm going to do a little bit of cheating because I'm going to to focus the story. To, to the current wars, which is the period between um, uh, uh, between 1888 and, and 1898. So it's a period of, of about 10 years. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and set the stage for that period. Uh, and after a while, I'm going to use what happened in that world to extrapolate and talk about uh, what is going on in our society today. So. Uh, the one, the, the only pitch that I'm going to make about Invention Matters and my company tonight is what I just put there. Invention Matters, we use deep technology and licensing expertise to identify key opportunities through intellectual property assets. So basically, uh, we uh, work with companies on, on buying, selling, licensing IP, and asserting their IP in some cases we also uh, work with them on, on a strategic positions, positioning of their IP uh, in the context of industry trends and, and where technology is, is moving. So. so Thomas Edison is, is born in, in the year 1847. When you compare that to Nikola Tesla, 
King Claus tells lies is born uh, almost 10 years after. So keep that in mind that there is about a 10 year difference between, uh, be between the two uh, uh, people. By, eight, by 1869, uh, Thomas Edison far, found his first patent, and his first patent is on the, uh, uh, on the boat recorder. And, and that's where he starts quite a bit his, his career as an inventor. And, and before we get into, into a lot of the stuff that happened, let me, let me set a little bit of the state of affairs for that time in the history. At, at, that, at that time, um, electricity is, is, is starting to become mainstream, but, but the main solution is an arc lamp system. And uh, 3,000 volts I, uh, is, is fairly common at that, at that time. As you can imagine, uh, is, 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 is a safety issue, uh, is, 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 is a concern. And, and that is the stage, basically kind of wires going on top of your head at 3,000 volts. And of course, the main issue from a technology perspective is, is the distance. A matter of distance. The fact that uh, if, if you are going to transmit, you have the I square R losses, and if you want to 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 uh, to transmit a longer distance, then it becomes very expensive to try to achieve a low R and reduce the amount of of uh, power loss over that distance. Now let me let me talk a little bit about what happens. There, by, by, remember, by 1869, Thomas Edison did the first patent recorder. However, uh, by 1876, you realize uh, he set up what is, what is called uh, Menlo Park, which is an industrial research lab. Now, this is, this is not just any lab. We are talking that he set this lab in a way that it becomes an invention factory. And, and in, in this invention factory uh, is the first invention factory in the US. And it becomes the model for other cities and other places to follow. And, and he is basically a visionary for his time in the way that he set up this factory. And that's the one that you see in the picture. He said the, the factory with some um, a very, very, um, aggressive goals. Uh, one of his goals with the factory is that he will produce an invention every 10 days. <laughs> and he will produce a big thing every six months. So, 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 so you see that he set up a, a, a factory that is very systematic and where he, he focused on, on creating inventions and having what, what nobody else has it. He has a lot of resources at some point for the incandescent light lamp. He claims to have a thousand different types of material in his inventory to try to address all the possibilities. And, and he fix any type of problem that he want to address. And he has split up the problem in different teams where different teams are addressing different sections of the problem and he is the director that, that leads, leads this orchestra, where, where he actually goes ahead, supervise these teams, and point to what direction they should try and where they should go. Not only that, they will, they will go ahead and record diligently every single failure that they make on a notebook in such a way that they, in many cases, go as many possibilities as they can, and they use that immense database to actually address the direction of where they are going through innovation. By, by uh, 1877, uh, one year later, Edison already have improved the telegraphic devices, and he has come into the invention of the phonograph. Once he goes to the invention of the phonograph, the rest is history for, for, uh, for Edison. At that point, he 
he is called the wizard of, of Menlo Park. And at that point, he becomes, uh, he basically achieved, um, he achieved the, uh, celebrity status and, and he becomes extremely popular all over the all over the US. And then he, of course, due to the expenses that happens in the in the industrial lab, he starts to need backing from investors. And at that point, he received uh, investment money from Western Union. Uh, he actually tied a lot of the royalties in his communication devices uh, to, to, to Western Union. And uh, basically in 1878, if you see two years later, he actually come out with, with the patent 223-898, which is the patent for the commercial practical incandescent lights. It's basically a, 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 a filament that is very reliable for, for his time uh, that, that, uh, that proved to be scalable for, for commercial use. And, and that patent becomes a very critical patent for the, for the current world. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. In 1879, he forms the Edison Electric Light Company and is, is backed up by JP Morgan and some other in, uh, investors at that time. And um, uh, you can see that by, by 1880, Edison already was thinking about a whole uh, distributing system or, or electricity, electricity distribution. Basically, he thought, you know what, I have, I have the light, I need to have the rest of the system uh, such that I can take over the whole market in the, in the US. Uh, by, by 1882, uh, Edison embarked uh, into a huge project, and the project represent the, the, the pinnacle of all the development that he is doing at this time. And by pinnacle, I, I mean he is looking at lighting up Manhattan at that point. And what this represents is distributing uh, all the cable the, 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 the cables and uh, generation and the lights for 14 miles in Manhattan, a very, very ambitious pro uh, project at the time. Uh, Edison believes that uh, his way of doing things through DC is the only uh, safe method. And in order to be safe, he's going to go ahead and, and dig uh, the trenches and, I'm and he's going to set up all his cable on the ground. He goes ahead and put this, the first seven miles of his system, and then um, basically uh, they decide to test it. And after they have dig and put all the cables and have covered the whole thing up, realize that there is a lot of shorts and problems in the system. As, as you can realize, uh, unit level testing is very, very in his infancy and, and um, uh, bottom up uh, type of processes are, are not quite there yet. They, they catch up fairly quick into the fact that they need to test all the modules before they get deployed. And, and, and by the end of 1882, uh, he is actually able by December to, to light up uh, 82 customers and, and that becomes a huge success for him. One of the customers that comes at this point is actually JP Morgan. Uh, JP Morgan, of course, with, with, with all, all, all the resources that he has, he uh, actually um, uh, ordered the latest system that Edison has. And in his house, he installed basically uh, one state of the art illuminating system with all the um, um, uh, hookups to upgrade the system at, at his move along. And, uh, and uh, he becomes one of the first persons that, that uh, can actually go ahead and, and, uh, and, and enjoy uh, the Edison system at that time. Okay. So it is, it is uh, 1880, that's, that's where the, the, the situation is. 
Uh, I talked already about, about the, 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 the problem, but, but there comes a new development. And this new development is in Europe, is basically AC transformers come into, into the game. And an engineer with the name of William Stanley Jr. will be the first to actually build and design a practical transformer here in the US. He, he comes uh, uh, with, with his ideas uh, from some of the designs in Europe. And, and fairly soon in 1885, uh, uh, Westinghouse talked to him and convinced him to start working for him. Westinghouse start to work in electricity in 1884, which is exactly the same year where uh, Nikola Tesla actually arrived to the US. So, so, so picture this for a moment. We are talking, we are talking that um, um, uh, Edison is already achieved celebrity status. Edison has a whole uh, invention factory with a peak of 50 to 60 engineers working for him. He has a system to develop and, 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 and build inventions. And in 1884, Nikola Tesla come as just an immigrant to this country. He, he comes and he starts working for, uh, for Tesla. He, he, he comes with a, with a recommendation uh, um, from one of the associates of uh, Tesla in Europe, and, and it's very interesting, uh, the recommendation that this person gives, his name is Istibad Arkuskas, and he sent a note to, to Edison about Tesla, and he says, you know what? There are two great men that I know. One of them is you, and the other one is the young man that is standing in front of you. So that was that was the recommendation that 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 he he gave for Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla was was hard, and he started working for for Edison. But uh, Nikola Tesla only lasted about a year working for for um, uh, for Edison. Uh, it is uh, the, the history mentions that at some point in time there was a bet, and um, there was a motor, a DC motor that uh, was failing and, and, and nobody could fix. And Edison uh, told Nikola Tesla, I bet you $50,000 that you cannot fix it. <laughs> well, you know what? That is a challenge that uh, Nikola Tesla could not pass. So a couple of weeks later, he came back with the motor already fixed. And he said, well, I won my $50,000. And the response from Edison Tesla was, come on, it was a joke. You, you clearly don't understand American, uh, um, 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 American language. I, 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 really, I really didn't mean it seriously. At that point, Nikola Tesla uh, decided to actually leave and they parted ways. Uh, later on that year, uh, Nikola Tesla uh, he started the Tesla Electric Light Company. He he started doing technology in 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 arcs. He was successful, but but the investors actually forced him out of his home company, and he ended up uh, working basically at a point where um, um, he he had to do some some work not even related to to electrical engineer uh, engineering to 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 be able to. Uh, to succeed, so uh, that was that was definitely um, um, uh, something that happens in 1885. By 1887, Nikola Tesla started to actually work in some of his ideas on the induction motor, and uh, he started to develop uh, quite a bit of this. He filed the first patent on the induction motor. And, and then uh, the patent office decided that no, that he has several inventions, and, and that patent becomes seven, the first seven patents that he files into that system.
Okay. Let me check here. Okay. So 1887, Nikola Tesla files, files the patents. Uh, and then uh, in 1888, Westinghouse buys the patents from Nikola Tesla and, and makes an agreement, a licensing agreement which is going to be very key, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, what you see in the picture is, is an early version of the Tesla induction motor, and 1888 is, is a very key year. And at this point, I want to talk about uh, somebody that could be familiar to some of the people in this forum. At this point, Thomas coming for Martin, uh, as editor of the electrical world, goes ahead and visit the lab of, of, uh, of Nikola Tesla. And he witnessed some of the work that Nikola Tesla is doing with, uh, with induction motors. And he is in a unique position. He is in the unique position to foresee that uh, uh, Nikola Tesla is about to become the, in the next electrical titan to challenge Edison. And not only that, Martin is in the position to actually bring, um, uh, bring Tesla into the right forum to present his ideas. And, and what he does next is that he sent, he talks to Tesla and they send some of his motors to a professor at Cornell to verify the efficiency and, and, and all the work that Tesla is, 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 is doing. And then he sets for a great meeting, goes like this. And, and the meeting is because Martin happens to be the president of the prestigious American Institute of Electrical Engineers. Of course, the American Institute of Electrical Engineers was to become what we know today as the IEEE about 60, 70 years later. This, this is, <coughs> at this point in time, to give you some sense about history, the, the, the Institute has only four years old. And, and the Institute is privileged to have some, some people that you can identify quite a bit. You can see that in the lighting committee already, Thomas Edison is leading that committee. And you can see that in communications, the guy that leads telephones area is none other than Alexander Graham Bell. So uh, basically, Martin goes ahead and, and work quite a bit at convincing uh, Edison, the, uh, at convincing Tesla that he should present his ideas at one of the key meetings of the IEEE. And, and, and for quite some time, Tesla decides that he is too tired and that he's not really interested in presenting his, his, his results into all of these. So it, it takes two or three different people that see the advantage of presenting in this forum. And at this point, finally, um, uh, Tesla decides to present what, what we uh, um, know today as 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 uh, as the first lecture to the to what is known today as the IEEE. The lecture was titled "A New System of Alternate Current Motors and Transformers," and in this meeting, uh, he actually went ahead and presented the two-phase Tesla AC motor. You see on the left you see what was known at the time, which was the traditional DC motor. And you can see, you can see in the picture, you can see the commutator. And you can see also the carbon brushes at that point. And, and um, at that point, many, many engineers had tried to create a motor that didn't have a commutator but 
it was widely believed that trying to get one without the commutator was was uh, was basically the challenge to create uh, a universal continuous motion machine that it was basically not possible so when edison uh when when tesla came and presented his two-phase tesla motor it was basically a revolution as, as as you can see in the diagram even though it shows his age you can see that it's extremely simple and there is beauty in simplicity basically uh the, you, you have the two faces you have given by, by by the color red and, and and green and you see the inner core that that rotates and and basically the whole concept of the two-phase tesla motor is based on the in two currents that are completely out of phase one is a sine function the other one is a cosine function and and uh, and, and people are just uh, at all at the invention from tesla because they 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 realize that uh, this is a game changer that 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 things that were not been able to do before now now uh uh this 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 could open uh basically the possibilities as they were not there before so now let me let me let me cover uh quickly what is known as the as the word of of currents and uh, uh and the word of the currents happens between the period of 1888 and 1898 at, at 1887 as i mentioned before tesla files for the seven patents on on ac motors and, and power transmission and uh, and then westinghouse buys those patents by 88 uh westinghouse already has a catalog with his own distributing system based on ac and then and then the war starts and everybody has that price in mind basically what will be the electric lighting system that will win on the market in order to win uh businesses and home and you see on one side you see the edison and 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 the, the the system that he has in mind of course has a dc current generator it has 110 volts dc as thought by him completely safe and and then he has of course the incandescent lamp and uh, and and then he has a galvanometer basically to measure how much uh, uh, it will charge the customers and so on. So basically he, ha he has the full, the full enchilada and not only that, he starts to sell his system uh, quite a bit. Now, a, 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 a main challenge for Edison remains that his system is only practical for high density uh, uh, cities or, or places where you have uh, a high density of houses, uh, and basically the limitation of the system is is distribution up to half a mile at that point. On the other hand, you have Westinghouse. Westinghouse, of course, has Tesla for all his motors, and then he also has a Stanley for the transformer. Uh, Westinghouse is 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 happens to be not only to be a good inventor but a great entrepreneur he is able to put uh, a group of geniuses eccentric people to work together and even though at many times they don't get along westinghouse is the glue that keep that team together and his system of course has uh, ac it, it uses transformers to a step up uh, transmit and then a step down, and then it uses the uh, e, the Edison DC system of centralized DC plants with short transmission range. At that point, so basically, he is leveraging the last part of their system in in uh, in in the Edison lab. Now the challenge is that Edison owns the patent for that incandescent lab, and that is that is definitely a problem. When you look at the situation from an, uh, an AP perspective, you realize that everybody is covering their tracks and is, is patenting their system, 
and is, is setting uh, the stage uh, to be able to win the market. And Westinghouse being the strategist that he is and knowing that he may have problems with, with the Edison lamp, he goes ahead and acquires the rights for the soldier man lamp, which are patents that are prior patents to what Edison did. And he tries to set the stage and start working in, in his own in his own um, his own design to circumvent uh, the, the the Edison uh, patent. So at, at the main court of all of this is the patent two 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 three eight ninety eight. This is the patent for the electric lamp done by by Edison, and the situation is quite a bit singular. Edison GE of that time is 10x the size of Westinghouse, and they own the patent. And Edison has a seven seven year lead on the competition. And as is as is this is as is this is not enough. Edison General Electric is suing Westinghouse and his customers on 312 lawsuits. Basically, everywhere where Westinghouse uh, has uh, one of their notes or a franchi uh, franchise, uh, they are basically suing them and suing their customers all the way through the U.S. So it's, it's, it's quite a bit of a, of of of, of of a serious situation for Westinghouse. Basically, at that time, this will be the equivalent of a billion dollar lawsuit. And not only that, there is an issue. The issue is when you're going against Edison and you have 312 lawsuits to go through, the question is who wants to take the case? Most of the really, really seasoned lawyers, they have a problem. They consider the case to be a career killer or they already are in business with uh, JP Morgan and some other people back up with uh, Edison General Electric. So they don't want to take the case because of conflict of interest. At this point, um, uh, Westinghouse hired Paul Cabras at his lead litigator. Cabrac is, 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 uh, is, is someone that doesn't have a lot of experience as a lead litigator. And the, que the question is, is this move insane or brilliant? Because definitely you will think that, that Paul Cabrac is out of his depth to handle a case like this. However, uh, Paul, Paul, Paul uh, it starts to work in the case, and um, 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 Paul proved to be quite uh, the person that, that Westinghouse needs. And at this point, you realize the different techniques that Paul is using to try to beat Edison uh, and his patent. Uh, uh, the, 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 the big question first, of course, comes as, did Edison actually invent the electric lamp? Well. Paul Cabrac starts and, and, and goes ahead and do, does a very, very extensive uh, prior art search to try to put holes and see if there is any prior art to justify and, 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 and invalidate any some patents. And, and, and they work extensively in that, in that part and, and realize that that is 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 uphill battle that Edison actually has done so much research and has tried so many things and and uh, and is 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 not there. Uh, so so the the second part is, well, can we prove that the patent is invalid because um, the only inventor that appears in the patent is Thomas Edison? What about the other people in his lab that obviously work uh, in the invention. So Paul Cabrat and his team uh, dedicate quite a bit of an effort to make a research and understand how the uh, invention factory works and try to interview engineers and people that work there 
and they they uh, interview quite a bit of these engineers, but get to the conclusion that Edison has split the problem in such a way that a lot of other people contributed, but didn't contribute on a significant manner. He had split the problem at such a granular level that Edison is the one that puts everything together at the end with the help of all this team, but the contribution of the team doesn't amount enough for uh, becoming an inventor in, in, in the patent. Finally, uh, they, 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 Paul Karak decides that, you know what, we are going to try the same way that Edison uh, does his invention. And Paul Cabrat, that since he doesn't have a lot of money, he goes ahead and goes to the university and recruit uh, cheap law students to use as workforce to try to fight the patents with Edison. That will be the equivalent in our days to, to buy a students with pizza. Well, <laughs> his system, his system will become what nowadays we know in modern law, where you where you hire the students out of the university and you hire them as associates until they prove their worth and then they get promoted. And, and, and eventually, uh, Paul Cabrath became very famous for, for his system at the conclusion of, 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 of the whole of the whole trial. 1887. As, as, as the popularity of the AC system it starts to, uh, to, to increase and so on, um, uh, Brown and some of the people that were considering the, uh, the electric chair at the time, uh, Edison received a visit from them. And Edison realized that he has a golden opportunity and even though he is uh, a man that doesn't believe in the, in the death penalty, he suggests that the best instrument for uh, the, the, the electric chair will be a, a Westinghouse generator, an AC motor done by, by, by Westinghouse. And, and uh, uh, he, of course, with his fame, he attended some of the forum created by, by Brown, which is uh, is supposed to be an independent, unbiased expert that is uh, uh, um, proposing the, the electric chair. And, and the, the presence of Edison provides a lot of recognition to, to, to this part, but the damage is, is done. And the damage is a brilliant move by Edison because from that point on, a term is coded in the press. And every time that uh, the death penalty is going to apply to, to, to an individual, they call that Westinghousing. So Westinghousing became a term uh, 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 associated with, with the electric uh, 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 chair, the, the death penalty. This is something that Westinghouse was to, to, to fight and, and take take his fight to the press to to clean up his rep, his 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 reputation uh, and so on. Uh, one one one. Uh, uh, so, some time after this, also in 1888, Edison actually writes an 84 page pamphlet, and the pamphlet is titled "A Warning from the Edison Electric Light Company." And he sent this to all the newspapers and to the potential purchases uh, of, of, um, of companies that are about to buy the equipment from Westinghouse. And, and basically the claim is that AC system is unsafe and is, and is dangerous. And, um, uh, and, and, and Westinghouse gained a breakthrough because just when things about, were about to get worse, uh, Harold Brown, the unbiased uh, expert, uh, it, is, it is discovered that he actually had colluded with Thompson, Thompson Houston who pay to get the generators. And, and, and then they discover also correspondence showing that Edison General Electric participated in the specification of the motors for the electric chair, uh, basically proving 
that Harold Brown was in collusion with, with Edison and, and that started to even out in the press the perception uh, of, of, the, uh, uh, of, uh, of how safe um, um, the, the AC system was. There was also another fact. The other fact was that while Edison and Brown was preaching about how safe AC was, several uh, uh, electricians and electrical engineers uh, stepped forward and mentioned, you know what? Uh, I was hit by AC and I'm still alive. I actually got, got a jolt and, uh, I, I, uh, uh, and it, it, it was not a pleasant experience but I am alive to, to tell it, so I can I can tell you that it's not as as uh, as dangerous as as it's, as as it's claimed to be. So now let me let me let me ask, uh, let, let me let me tell a little bit about 1891. In 1891, uh, basically, uh, it is rumor that Tesla is working in some uh, weird experiments. Experiments that 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 uh, that uh, uh, that that shows how lights will turn on, and there is a technology that is extremely advanced, uh, more advanced to what is in the market. And Martin decides that it's his time to visit again to uh, uh, to to Nikola Tesla, and he convinced him to do a second a second talk. So for a moment, let me let me let me. Let me try to paint a picture for you. We are, we, we are in, 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 in 1891. Edison, with all his fame and so on, is claiming that AC is unsafe. And after all, Edison is the father of the incandescent lamp. This is, that, is, that is his baby and so on. And there comes Nikola Tesla to, to this lecture. And, and, and in this lecture, Nikola Tesla uh, brings a, a, a new device of his invention. He brings the Tesla coil. And, and, and let me see if I, can, if I can show you really quickly a Tesla coil. Let's, let's see if this, if this works for a moment here. Um, Oh. <laughs> Edwin, expand, uh, take it off the slides for a moment so we can see you better. Yeah. Okay, lead up. <laughs> so yeah, that's good. Anyway, imagine imagine Tesla comes with 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 this Tesla coil and and lights up a bulb that doesn't have a filament and is not connected to any wires. At this point, he has the whole audience of the IEEE meeting mesmerized because this clearly beats whatever is in the streets. And this is living proof that AC is not as dangerous as this is claimed, since the Tesla coil that he, he used at the meeting is a 20,000 volt type of Tesla coil. So, so basically, at, 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 uh, uh, he basically, in, in one night, really disproved quite a bit of, the, of, of, of what is being said about, about AC at the time. It is it is it is cataloged as, as one of the most brilliant and fascinating lectures uh, by the electrical uh, world at, at, at that time, and and uh, uh, at that point, the subject matter experts and, and the people consider uh, uh, Nikola Tesla as as just a genius. 
that, that has all these potential and these technologies to come in the future. So in, in 1889, uh, due to all the, uh, all the conflict, uh, all, all the lawsuits between Edison and Westinghouse, Edison actually has been deluded so much as, a, uh, as an entrepreneur that he actually loses uh, majority control in Edison General Electric. And then in 1891, Edison General Electric merges with, with Thomson Houston. This is, this is a huge blow to Edison because he, he doesn't respect Thomson Houston. And not only he doesn't respect uh, Thomson Houston uh, because they infringe some patents and so on, uh, in that merger of, of Edison and, and, and Thomson Houston, uh, basically uh, JP Morgan uh, betray Edison and supports the guys from Thomson Houston and the name Edison in, in, um, in, 18, in, in 1892 is removed from the name of the company. And, and, it, and instead of being Edison General Electric, it becomes General Electric. This is, this is a huge blow to Edison, a blow that, that, uh, that eventually he, he didn't recover uh, at that point. His biographer wrote about that to Morgan. It made little difference so long as it resulted on, on him being the, the, the banker. But as the author of the book uh, mentioned, uh, Edison basically had been morganized <laughs> basically by the investors at, the, at, at that point. And, and that was a term that was used back then in, in, uh, uh, in, in Wall Street. Uh, I am pretty sure that he didn't appreciate the use of that term on, on, on him at, at that time. Later on, 1892, uh, Westinghouse uh, wins the bid for uh, uh, for the Chicago Convention and eventually uh, wins quite a bit of the contract for Niagara Falls at that point. And the Niagara Falls uh, project become one of the greatest Nikola Tesla achievement uh, at, 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 uh, at that time. So let me, let me talk a little bit about the end of the war. The end of the war comes on a very interesting matter. Uh, when you look at the patent, um, um, at the end, the patent is upheld uh, before the Supreme Court. But just when everything is lost, Paul Cabrat managed to convince JP Morgan that uh, both companies, Westinghouse and General Electric, will actually go bankrupt if they continue uh, suing each other in court. <laughs> and he convinced JP Morgan that what they need to actually do is a license, a cross-license agreement between their patents. Quit fighting, move forward, do a licensing agreement and, 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 and move along. Uh, at that point, uh, in, in 1897, after this, this happened, Edison sold all his remaining stock in Edison Electric Illuminating Company and, and decided to start inventing in a whole different field that was not related to, to, to electricity. Basically, uh, iron refining, uh, creating a whole prototype uh, for this. And this is, this is how the war actually ended. It actually ended through a license agreement. And this is, this is a, a big lesson, oftentimes, uh, uh, we don't realize for, for Edison, it was a matter of, of pride and a matter of, of, of ego with respect to the patent. Uh, but many times IP works actually ended up with a certain 
and, and selling into a license agreement. And this one, of course, is how this one uh, ended at the time. This one, 1907, uh, is, 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 is another license agreement that I wanted to review tonight. And is when, when uh, Westinghouse uh, bought the Tesla patents from Nikola Tesla, he bought the patents for $60,000, 150 shares, and $2.50 royalty per horsepower, plus a 2000 monthly salary, which was a generous amount at that time. Well, in 1907, Westinghouse was in a very, very difficult economic situation. And Westinghouse visited uh, Tesla, and he appealed to Nikola Tesla and told him, the fate of the Westinghouse company is in your hands. Either you renounce to your contract, or I'm going to lose my company because I cannot pay the royalty of $2.50 uh, per horsepower. <laughs> At that point, Nicholas Tesla stand up and tore up the contract that he had. And, and, and he said, well, you, you were the one who believed in me. I don't care about this. And he tore up the contract. Uh, that decision by Nikola Tesla in 1907 ended up being probably the worst decision of his life <laughs> because uh, those two dollars and fifty cents. A couple of years later, uh, the demand was at seven million horsepower, uh, as as it was at that point, which was the equivalent of fifty fifteen million dollars. It will have made the growth of the of the AC system at that time within a five to ten year period will have made Nikola Tesla the richest man in the world. Nikola Tesla failed to understand some basic uh, facts about licensing. The first fact is that the decision was not to be binary, either yes or no. He could actually could have helped Westinghouse waiving. Uh, reducing the royalty to something more manageable, or he could have waived the royalty for two or three years while the industry rebounded and then reassigned the royalty. But when he tore up the contract, he actually lost, uh, lost, lost millions and, and lost basically the big contribution from a financial side uh, on, on, uh, on the industry. By 1908, uh, Edison sent a message to George Stanley, son of, of William Stanley, saying, you know what, I recognize I was wrong. Your, 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 your transformers on AC was superior uh, to the DC system that I had. Uh, Will Edison had um, uh, accepted uh, and be more open-minded on the AC system he will have probably uh, be one of the dominants or the dominant player since Thompson Houston, the one that, that, uh, that actually inherited quite a bit of that position, uh, came later on. Edison actually had some options on the AC system. He just thought it was too dangerous from the start. So basically the, the the word ended with with uh, 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 with that licensing agreement for the for the different players uh, Westinghouse died in in nineteen fourteen his net worth at the time was was fifty million and his companies about four or five companies were worth around two hundred millions uh, Edison died as the most prolific inventor with one thousand ninety three patents and his net worth was 12 million after after he left uh, uh, the electrical system, he actually works on more on the phonograph and 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 he he was very reluctant to um, to start selling radios, which became very popular. If he will have let his sons who 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 were controlling his phonograph business, he will have probably dominated also. Uh, the entertainment business because the phonograph 
was in such a big demand that if he would have just accepted selling also radios, he would have probably dominated uh, that business also. Uh, in the case of Tesla, uh, he, he, he died penniless. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he ran out of money. He had other projects of wireless transmissions and, and some service that were way ahead of his time. And, and uh, although he was bitter at times, he was very satisfied as a, as a big humanist that he has given AC to the world and so on. Now, let's, let's move to, 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 no, to our days. And I think that we can, we can identify with, with this picture. And, and this is the part of the talk where I say uh, IP rule, uh, and then I say it still does. And, and you knew kind of that there was some, uh, some chemistry between these two individuals for sure. Uh, everyone, this, this kind of illustrate what everyone thought about, uh, about the other inventor. Uh, in, in, in that case, of course, uh, Steve Jobs thought that, that, that Bill Gates didn't have taste uh, and, and so on. And Bill Gates, of course, uh, thought that, that Steve Jobs uh, didn't know anything about engineering because he could not program anything. Uh, so that's, 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 that's interesting. However, when, when you look at, at some of the things that happened in, 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 in history, it's, it's very interesting to remember that in 1988, there was a big, uh, a big lawsuit. The big lawsuit was a $5.5 billion lawsuit. At that point, uh, the revenues of Apple were Four billion and Microsoft was five hundred and ninety million, and the the reason of this lawsuit, I think that most of the people in this uh, forum may remember, was because Windows 1.0 was released, and at that point the accusation was that Microsoft was stealing uh, some of the uh, Apple's IP, and and that was okay up to a point, but when Windows 2.0 was released and the amount of content of, of, of Apple using the mouse became uh, uh, almost, uh, almost a similar uh, copy of what Apple was doing in their graphical user interface, the people at Apple was outraged. They, they didn't send any letters they actually jump quickly and submit the 5.5 billion lawsuit. It was, for them, it was a register. If, if, if you remember uh, the apples of that time, the use of a mouse to go over icons and, and launch a program, that was a huge breakthrough in, in graphical user interfaces. And, and, and the, peop the fact that 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 uh, that Microsoft would put that functionality in Windows uh, in their next release, it was seen as as IP that was stolen. Now, when you look at history, it's, it's very interesting because, as they mentioned, the devil is actually in the details. The Apple legal team with the Apple executive were so outraged. They, they didn't read their own contract, their licensing contract, where it will say that they license Apple features in Windows 1.0 and then all future Microsoft software programs. So they, they actually uh, lost the lawsuit by their own uh, licensing terms. And, and after a couple of years, basically, uh, uh, the, the lawsuit was, was dismissed and, and Microsoft uh, was allowed to keep most of all the features except by the recycle bin. Other than the recycle bin, uh, Windows get, got to keep pretty much all the icons and the way that they, they function and so on because the licensing terms were very clear that they, uh, they had the right to, to, to go 
to get that functionality in the future Microsoft software programs. Move about um, um, nine years later, and, and, and then the situation is, is interesting because at that point, um, Steve Jobs pretty much uh, is, is out uh, and, and is, is about to return to, to, to Apple. Apple uh, had one billion net loss and is a situation of bankrupt. And in this situation of bankrupt, you will think that Microsoft will will actually uh, uh, enjoy this situation and will let Apple die. However, contrary to what many people think, uh, Bill Gates think about it, and Steve Jobs think about it, and realize that it's actually the way the, the other way around. Microsoft actually needs to save Apple and invest 150 million because instead of this rivalry between Microsoft and Apple, Apple actually is one of the biggest customers for Microsoft. They actually sell their software to Apple. So why would you let them die? Might as well just invest in them and, and keep, keep them as one of the great customers. And, and from Steve Jobs' perspective, he realizes that his job is not to compete with Microsoft. His job is to take the competition to a uh, Way a different level. That that his 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 uh, his next frontier is not at the at the operating system itself, but at a higher level of abstraction. Well, we know we know how history play out, and 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 later on is close to what we have. But what we have in the bottom is both companies do a tremendous amount of money into IP licensing. So clearly. Uh, IP is, 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 is a very strong variable for both of them. Well, a couple, a couple other, other companies that I want to talk about, one of them is, uh, is, is Qualcomm. And when you look at Qualcomm from an electrical engineering perspective, you see something in this graph that is very, very interesting. And, and look at the graph because the graph shows shows something that many people don't realize. For one, when you think of Qualcomm, oftentimes you think of Qualcomm as a, as a chip company, a company that fabricates chips for the mobile market. And that is the perception that many people has. However, when you look at the numbers, you see in the left, and you realize that in their, uh, in their, Qualcomm CDMA Technologies, which is the business that they are where they sell the chips, in 2016, they sold about $17 billion. However, the income, the operating key income out of those $17 billion was around $2 billion. On the right, you have their licensing, their technology business, that the, where they license their IP, and at that point you realize that in licensing fees they 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 got a billion, and the operating income of that was around seven. Well, this is a a, a, a very strong argument to to say that Qualcomm is in the licensing business, not in the chip semiconductor business, because they are making way much more money into licensing that in the chip chip business. And, and uh, let me make another point on, 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 on this part also. 2017, Apple is, uh, well, to explain, before I get into that, let me, let me, let me say something. Uh, Qualcomm through IP change, change the dynamic of the game. If, 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 if you are familiar with the chip semiconductor industry, you realize that for the last 30 or 40 years, uh, when you sell a chip, you used to sell everything that entitled with that chip. Oftentimes, you even included software to support some of that functionality. And what you pay for the chip, uh, that was it. However, Qualcomm changed, uh, changed that story. Qualcomm says, no, you pay me for the chip, but I have a series of patents and IP 
that let this industry come into being. And for you to play in this ecosystem that I have created, and my ecosystem includes the different communication standards like, five, like 3G and 5G, you have to pay me an extra amount in licensing. So you pay for the chip on, on, on one side, and you pay for the licensing in the other side. And that's the reason this figure uh, looks the way it does. As, as you can imagine, this, is, this was a brilliant move because the chip business is exposed to Moore's law. And, and, and as the manufacturing uh, moves uh, and, and progresses along, you, you always have, it needs to design more on the digital domain to, to get enough value and you're in this constant battle. Well, you can see that the uh, IP licensing business is very healthy and very well. And of course, very soon companies didn't like to be the, the, the customers or the victims of that model. And in 2017, Apple decided that they had had enough and they filed a antitrust lawsuit against Qualcomm. Well, let me, let me tell you, Apple at this point in time has a market cap of 790 billion and, and, and Qualcomm has a market cap of 76. So basically, Apple is 10 times as large as, as, uh, as, as Qualcomm. However, two years pass, and two years later, uh, Apple decides that they have had enough. They settled the lawsuit. Qualcomm is about to receive 4.5 billion in 2019. They end up licensing and, and an agreement to buy Qualcomm chips, and the next day, Intel decides to sell the 5G business that they have. That tells you quite a bit about the power of, of IP and the power of the patent portfolio and the hand that, that, that Falcon uh, had at that moment. One more before, before I, 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 I finish tonight's talk. The, 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 the next one that I want to bring is, is ARM. ARM is a chip design firm that doesn't manufacture or sell any chips. This is an interesting one because if, if, uh, if, if you're familiar with, with, with the business from ARM, you know that uh, they don't fabricate any chips. However, they actually dominate the mobile market. All the, the, the cell phone manufacturers uh, and, 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 and many of the IoT, uh, they use ARM chips. And, and you have now multi-core and heterogeneous systems, all of that based on ARM chips. How can a company uh, be bought by $31 billion, more than Nokia, Motorola, uh, any of the other ones that have been acquired before, when the only thing that you have is patents? You don't, they don't manufacture anything. They're in the IP licensing business. So this is, this is yet another model that, that shows the value of the intellectual property in the case, in this case, from, from uh, ARM itself. The last one here, it shows the number of unicorns through the last few years. And you see that the unicorns have been increasing in numbers and some of these unicorns, companies that achieve a valuation of $1 billion or more, some of these unicorns, um, they get to these valuations so quickly to investor money that what is becoming common for some of them uh, is to actually buy their way around. So basically, as soon as they get to those valuations, in order for them to, to shield themselves, what they end up doing is actually they end up buying patent portfolios of some other companies to actually get, get protection and, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and shield that investment and, and be, be, uh, 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 be able to leverage that portfolio and move in, in, in other directions in the future. Some of the lessons tonight. The worst enemy that you can meet 
we will be always be yourself. This applies to, to Edison. At, at, at the last moment, when people look back and Martin made an analysis, Martin as, as, as president of the IEEE looked back in time, uh, his analysis was that, that Edison actually defeated Edison. The fact that he was not willing to be more open about AC pretty much cost him the, 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 the company. And often, oftentimes for, um, uh, for ideas and what we think about things, if we are not willing to be open enough to, to consider newer ideas that could be superior to what we have, eventually uh, we can pay a high price. There is, there is a quote from Clint Eastwood as Harry Callahan that most of us are familiar with. A man's gotta know his limitations. I, I, I like to change it and say an inventor slash entrepreneur got to know his licensing options. And if, and if he doesn't know it, he better check with a licensing attorney or a company that is working that space. Because as Tesla will tell you, it is very, very dangerous. You can, you can work in technology, you can achieve your dreams and, and you can lose it in a poor decision with respect to IP. Number three is inventing the future always costs more than what you think. When you look at, at Edison, Tesla, and even Westinghouse, most of, mo most of them end up losing their companies to JP Morgan because they underestimated how much capital was going to be needed and round after round ended up diluting uh, themselves and through one uh, uh, situation or another, they ended up losing quite a bit to the investors. The last one is, can David still defeat Polaya? The answer is, is yes. You can, you, can, you can see that in the case of Westinghouse, you see that in the case of Qualcomm, IP is that game changer. It's, 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 it's an uphill battle, but in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a world that is flat, where you can outsource uh, ideas and where you can design anywhere, the one who owns those ideas and protect them with IP is the one that is destined to have the, the upper hand. And the last one is those who cannot remember their past are condemned to, to repeat it. I want to finish tonight with the saying from Victor Hugo, there is nothing, nothing is stronger than idea whose time has come. Thank you. Thank you, that's a very good uh, presentation, uh, Edwin. So there's a few questions see if we can answer. I think one of them is uh, how much is IBM IBM earning in the uh, patent business, the licensing business? Do you know? Yes. Uh, so so I think that the last um, um, report that I that I that I have, which is not the most recent, is probably 2017 or, or 2018. I think that they put IBM around 1.2 billion. That's great. Okay. <clears throat> no, no, they, they, they don't disclose uh, a lot that that number. But what I, what I can tell you is that uh, uh, IPM is is uh, assert their patent portfolio very effectively, mm -hmm. and, and 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 they have become uh, basically a, a licensing strong house, and, and and they are very very good at it. Yes, right. <clears throat> yeah, I think in the chip business, TI is the first one who. Who's doing that the licensing? Yes. Maybe second to uh, Qualcomm now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So you can see the check uh, check box. You can find a question you want to ask. Let's see. Yes, I, I have a comment from from Dan. Uh, uh, and, 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 and Dan is correct. He's, he's pointing out that, that oftentimes pride 
is something that gets you. Uh -huh. uh, and that is that is true. Oftentimes, when we when we uh, uh, we, we when we let our ego mm -hmm. take the best of ourselves, uh -huh. we are very prone to take the the wrong decision. Uh, when when you look at history and 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 and, and quite a bit of the history from Edison and Tesla, you realize that actually Thomson Houston, which was a company that didn't have a lot of IP, ended up doing uh, extremely well because uh, their approach was actually to negotiate and do licensing agreements instead of litigate. And uh, they moved quick, they managed very well, and at the end, they ended up doing uh, extremely well later on. So any other question? Or? There, is, there is another question here uh, from, from Jonathan. It says, what is your advice to startups that have IP that can change the future? Um, I think that I have a, a couple of, 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 of points with regard to that. Uh, I, I, I will say, uh, yes, invest in IP. IP is costly and you need to uh, you need to invest in that IP because otherwise you won't be able to uh, to get the return on investment. But, but the other point that I want to, to talk about that is, is what oftentimes patents are not enough. Oftentimes on an extra, you file patents, but the question on those patents are, can you actually enforce those patents? If, if you, you can file a lot of patents, and in many domains, if, if a patent requires for me to see what is under the hood, and, and, and reverse engineer code or look in the middle of a processor, uh, if it's a chip design or so on, oftentimes the patent is, has little value. It, it has a value to, 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 to tell the investors that, that, uh, that we have proprietary technology, but as far as, as, as licensing and, and being able to, to leverage the patent against the market is, is of little value in that case. So there's a question from uh, Roof, uh, David Roof. I hear that changes in patent law have made patents less valuable recently. Can you come on that? I think they open up the patent law. Yes, thing. can you, can you, I, I don't have, let me see, I don't see. Uh, um, kind of. From can the you repeat the question, Kari? Okay, so uh, the question was, I hear that changes in patent law has made patent less valuable recently. Maybe the short the period or I thought the yes, that, no, that is that is that is a really good point and, and I didn't get into it. So so the, the problem is this with the with the changes that came into into patents, uh, patent reform, uh, when 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 you uh, uh, file a lawsuit to another company for patent infringement, mm -hmm. they have the right to challenge that patent uh, in the USPTO. And, and uh, when you look at the statistics, 60 to 70% of the patents that get challenged, get invalidated. Uh, this, is, this is not hard to believe because now all the, uh, the patent databases of all the world are online. So it, it, it if you want to invalidate a patent, you can do an extensive search for prior art to invalidate that patent. This tells you a couple of things. One is if uh, if, you're, if, if you uh, truly value your your ideas and your technology, you need to file more than one patent. You want to actually file patent families such that if, if one gets invalidated, you still have two or three protecting still other aspects of, of, of that IP okay. and so on. And that is key and that is the strategy that, that uh, many of the big firms are, are going for. Right, right, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a improvement process. Okay, any other questions?
I see a comment from, from, from Dan with respect to uh, AC drive technology and so on, and, uh, and, uh, and he is correct. The technology has, has completely changed in motors for the last uh, few, few years with, with overdrive and so on, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a whole different ball game. Um, um, I, I see a, a comment here that says, isn't the success of Microsoft and Apple to some degree uh, due to the exploitation of underprotected IP? And, and, and the answer can be yes in some of those cases. Uh, in, in some of these cases, let me tell you that that, uh, that is a really good point. Uh, in, in, in the environment that we live, bringing litigation into somebody is, is a very expensive proposition. So uh, unfortunately, many of the big companies, uh, if you see something that is hot in the market, a new technology, you go ahead and, 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 and integrate that feature in your new product and, 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 and you don't consider who is the company that brought it in unless there is a huge competitor. And, and, and you're banging in that, that, that you're, they're not going to file a lawsuit against you in that regard. Uh, those are actually one of a few of the cases that Invention Matters works uh, very often. Basically, they, they, they beat against Goliath. We work with, with, with law firms and, and, and investors, funders that, that pick those type of battles to enforce uh, patent portfolios. So you're completely right in that regard. Uh, there is another one, Microsoft CPM. Uh, let me see if I read it here. Okay. Microsoft CPN to DOS Apple, the mouse and ecosystem front. Yes, yes, it is it's, it's true. Microsoft and Apple uh, got quite a bit of that technology from from Xerox uh, part. Is is that is that is that is correct? Uh, do startups uh, kind of still have an advantage over the Amazons, Google, WalMarts, etc., especially in light of their infinite. Uh, uh, money washes. Uh, you know the the answer, the answer is yes, uh, the, the, and that this is this is a very interesting question. It, when, uh, something that that I think that uh, that we need to be aware of is that now that transistors are extremely cheap, you have billions of transistors on a chip. And, and now you have cloud-based systems that are extremely economical to implement any system. I think that, that uh, yes, they do have infinite budgets, but they, we, we have moved into a, into a time where uh, the problem is not technology anymore. The, 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 the barrier of entry is, is imagination. It's, it's actually uh, thinking what is there to come and, and how, to, how, how to invent uh, what is needed and what is going to be the current system. So that's one, one question at uh, 7.58 p.m. What is your advice to startups that have IP that can change the future? That means very good potential. How do you protect those IP? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question, and, and um, uh, my answer is, is very simple. Uh, I, am, I am involved in projects that, are, that I'm uh, working with some of the big companies, uh, and they, they, play, they play the game on a, on a way different way that most of startups play the game. Most of startups, they actually just, just, just file the patent and, and, and be done with it. Uh, most of the of the big firms that are involved in lawsuits and litigate and have licensing programs, they file patents, but then they uh, evaluate those patents on how those patents can be asserted and how to play the market against the infringers. Uh, and 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 uh, we work on those type of projects. Uh, my advice to startups would be 
look for firms like ours and firms with, with subject matter experts that look at patent filing from a different perspective. Basically, look at patent filing from the perspective of what will I need if I want to assert or enforce a patent? Can this patent be actually enforced and how easy it will be? And, and the mindset is, is completely different. Uh, patents by the big boys are being customized to be used two or three years down the road against a specific targets. There is no reason to say that the small companies cannot do exactly the same and, and get, the, get to high valuations in, 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 in a few years. Okay, I, I think the time is at 8.06 p.m. now. So thank you for talking to us. And um, I would like to get a copy of your presentation so we can post in the in the web. Also, we we'll, we we'll record it, but I'm not sure how to get it back from the uh, WebEx. But I'll try to to get it recorded okay. and post it. Okay. Uh, I will I will send it to you. No problem. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. And thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. 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 <laughs> Let me see.